First of all, thank you so much to PopTech for having me. It's a uh, deep pleasure and privilege to be here. I'd, I'd like to begin talking um, about a relatively obscure 1919 essay by the sociologist Thorsten Veblen. It's called The Intellectual Preeminence of the Jews in Europe. And it was commissioned by an American Zionist magazine. And at the time, Veblen was a famous public intellectual, best known for his book, The Theory of the Leisure Class. And they wanted him to write on the topic of what would happen to Jewish creativity, to Jewish intellectual life, if there was a Jewish homeland. If all of a sudden, the Jews of Europe were freed from institutional anti-Semitism and always being on the margins, what would happen? And they assumed he would make the obvious argument. They assumed he would say that if Jews were freed from anti-Semitism, from the yoke of having to be adjunct faculty and always having to be on, you know, being the Swiss patent clerks and not tenured faculty, then, then, then there would be this boom. Then they'd create more things. And you have to remember at the time, it was uh, 1919. Einstein was about to win the Nobel Prize. Freud was a best-selling author. So, so Jews were already at the center of intellectual life. And they assumed, Veldman would argue, that if Jews had their own homeland, they'd, they'd, they'd be even more creative. They'd be even more dominating when it came to the intellectual life of Western Europe. But Veldman, of course, was a provocateur. And he didn't have patience for obvious arguments. So he turned this whole premise on its head. He argued that while the creation of a Jewish state might have many good side effects, it might actually diminish Jewish intellectual life. It might actually hinder Jewish creativity. And the reason he gave was that Jews were consummate outsiders, that they were always on the margins. They were exiled. They, they, they were in the ghetto. They were always adjunct faculty. And that meant that they were filled with what he called a skeptical animus. They were able to rebel against what he called the alien lines of Gentile inquiry. They were able to see problems that no one, that no one else noticed, to see the theoretical holes in, in Newtonian mechanics. And so in a sense, he argued that if Einstein had actually been tenured faculty at, say, the University of Heidelberg, that he never would have seen that modern physics needed a theory of relativity. It was only because he was a Swiss patent clerk in Bern that he was able to see the theoretical anomaly, the theoretical hole that no one else saw. Now, the reason I bring up Veblen is because I think his larger point about the virtue of being an outsider is actually a really important point. I think it's been justified by some interesting new research. And, and the, the first idea I'd like to talk about, I mean, I should, of course, mention that this is slightly counterintuitive. You know, obviously, if we've got really hard problems, a really difficult problem, we naturally give it we naturally want experts to solve it, people on the inside, the people with the most knowledge, the people closest to the problem. But that, it turns out, might actually be the exactly wrong thing to do. And, and the first experiment I'd like to talk about takes this idea of the outsider at its most literal. So when you're outside something, you're literally outside it distance-wise, spatially. This is an experiment, a clever experiment, done at, the, done at Indiana University. And the psychologist brought in hundreds of undergrads, brought them to their lab, and gave them a variety of inside puzzles. There are lots of different kinds of inside puzzles, but the basic idea is that inside puzzles are a test of creativity. They measure divergent thinking, how good you are at seeing remote associations, these subtle connections. So here's a typical inside puzzle. I'm going to give you three words, and you're going to find the fourth word that can form a compound word with these three words. This is called a compound remote associate test, or a CRAP problem. Um, <laughs> So the three words are, I have to read my hand, which I just washed, um, but mile, sand, and age. So those are the three compound words. What's the fourth word that can form a compound word with those three words? So, yeah, so someone just had a creative insight. So you give lots of undergrads these simple word problems and various other insight puzzles. And that allows you to measure their creativity. So these Indiana University psychologists brought all these undergrads, by the way, it's you know, milestone, sandstone, stone age, in case people were still wondering. Um, so, so you bring undergrads into your lab, and you give them all these different word problems and inside puzzles. And, and these scientists broke them into two groups. One group was told that the inside puzzles came from just down the hall. They were invented by a fellow psychologist at Indiana University. The other group was told that the problems came all the way from Greece. They were invented by a Greek psychologist. So, it really shouldn't matter where the problems came from, right? The exact same questions, the exact same answers, and yet people who thought the problems came all the way from Greece solved 40% more of them. And, and the obvious question is why? Why would that matter? Well, 
this is called construal level theory, but the basic idea is, imagine you're standing in a cornfield and I ask you to think about corn. You're going to think about corn the plant. You're going to think about the cellulose stalk and the delicious yellow kernels, which are sweet, and you're going to think about the straw-like husk. You'll think about the most obvious connotations of corn. But now I ask you to sit in Camden, Maine and think about corn. You might think about corn the plant and, and how delicious corn with butter is. You might think about corn as a source of fuel for cars, as ethanol. You might think, think about high fructose corn syrup and Michael Pollan and, and Coca-Cola. In other words, your, your sphere of associations will be much wider. The circumference of your thoughts has been literally expanded. And that's just because the problem seems farther away. It's one of those funny mental hiccups if you know about it, you can start to take advantage of. I think the most obvious implication of this has to do with vacation. You know, we go on vacation, we go to the remote tropical beach and bring our Pulp Fiction onto the beach so that we don't think about our problems at home, right? So that we can forget all about them. This research suggests that we should do the opposite, that we should sit on that beach and meditate on all that crap we can't solve at home because we'll be much more likely to solve it. So, so that, that's, that's the first way that being an outsider can be a virtue, so that you're literally farther away from the problem. You're literally outside the problem that allows you to think of it in new, more innovative, more creative ways. The, the second way being an outsider can be a virtue is being a cultural outsider. And this is a, another one of these very quick, clever studies. Economists at Northwestern Business School surveyed a couple hundred undergrad, couple hundred business students, excuse me, some of whom had lived abroad for three months or more, and some of whom hadn't. Once again, they gave them inside puzzles, and to make a long story short, the people who had lived abroad for three months or more, and it didn't even matter when they lived abroad, just the mere fact that they'd lived abroad at some point in their life allowed them to solve 20% more inside puzzles. So, so why? Well, just the simple experience of being an outsider, of realizing that there are many different ways to live a life, many different ways to interpret the exact same thing, somehow expands our minds. The, the last example of the virtue of being an outsider, this, this Veblen idea, is about being an intellectual outsider, about approaching a field from a slightly alien point. And, and I like to illustrate this with the website Innocentive.com. For those of you who don't know it, it's a very cool website where big multinational, lots of Fortune 500 companies post the problems they can't solve. So you have General Electric, Kraft, Eli Lilly, Procter & Gamble. These are companies with huge R&D budgets, tons of scientists on staff. Procter & Gamble itself is more PhD scientists than MIT and Berkeley combined. And they post the problems, the stubborn engineering problems they can't solve. So it might be a low calorie chocolate coating that doesn't melt at 150 degrees. It might be a solar powered wireless router that can work on cloudy days. Random stuff like that. Each prize, each, 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 each thing they want invented comes with a certain reward. So if you can invent the chocolate coating, you get $100,000 from Kraft, stuff like that. Now, you'd think, you know, if you were just thinking about this, you'd assume that not very many people could solve these problems. After all, if, if Procter & Gamble can't invent a better floor cleaner, if the 40 organic chemists at Procter & Gamble can't invent that, then why would some guy sitting at home in his pajamas be able to in, in, invent this new product? But what you actually find, if you look at the data of Innocentive, it's about 33% of all the problems posted on Innocentive get solved. And they get solved in a very interesting way. Turns out that if you post an organic chemistry problem on Innocentive, if Procter & Gamble really wants this new floor cleaner for its new line of Swiffers, chances are that organic chemistry problem won't be solved by an organic chemist. Chances are it'll be solved by a molecular biologist or a biophysicist or a population biologist who just happens to remember his organic chemistry from an undergrad. It'll be solved from someone just on the outside of the domain. And that's simply because, and this gets back to what Veblen was talking about, that simply because there is a virtue, a, a tremendous virtue in seeing something from the outside. It's what allows us to see the connections, to see the problems that, that no one else can see. Because if, you know, if chances are if you're an organic chemist, you're going to run into the exact same problem that all those organic chemists at Procter & Gamble ran into. It's not unless you're a molecular biologist looking at the problem slightly askance from a slightly different perspective that you're going to be able to see what no one else can see. You're going to realize that modern physics needs a theory of relativity. So, so the, the larger point, I think, is that sometimes our most impossible problems, the most difficult and intractable problems, they seem difficult and intractable, not because they actually are, but simply because we haven't looked at them from the outside. Thanks so much.